Hey everyone, it's Samuel, and welcome to Plot Hooks, the podcast where we explore the arts of narrative and collaborative storytelling in the world's premier RPG, Dungeons and Dragons. Today in the Prime Material, the Artificer class. In the Wilds, the Homunculus. And in the Tavern, what would you do if something went wrong at a performance? Hey everybody! I hope everyone is having a great day. I'm excited to talk about the Artificer class with you all today. It's an exciting and flavorful class, which I just love the idea of. This is going to be part one of a two-part series, because there's just too much information for us to cover as we're looking at a class in detail to cover both the class and all of its subclasses in one. So I'm going to be looking at the basic class today, and then we'll talk a little bit about the subclasses in part two. Before we get into the prime material, though, just a few announcements to get out of the way. Remember to follow us on all our social media. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You could subscribe to us on our YouTube channel if that would be your preferred way of listening to the podcast. Also, it would be awesome of you to support us on Patreon. The release of the Ikhmaset race happened last week. We're so excited that everyone has enjoyed it, and we look forward to continuing to release more supplements. There's actually a poll up right now to determine what we're going to be releasing next. But you get those supplements and even more perks if you become one of our patrons on Patreon. Your support is very much appreciated. It helps us make this podcast even better for you each and every day. And on that note, we have a new patron to shout out. Kevin, thanks very much for joining the Patreon. We hope you enjoy all your bonus content, and thank you very much for your support. All right, without further ado, let's dive into the Artificer class. The Artificer class was a class that was in the works for a while in D&D, appearing in a couple different revisions in the Unearthed Arcana, but it finally received its final official form in November of last year with the release of Eberron Rising from the Last War. So it's been a little over six months from that point, and so I figured it was about time for us to dive into this class, because a new class being released is a pretty big deal, because while... New subclasses are being added to Dungeons & Dragons with just about every supplement that isn't an adventure. This is the only official full-on class that's been released since the launch of the 5th edition Player's Handbook. And it's a new class for good reason, and it's not often that we can say that. The classes we already have cover such broad spectrums that there's not much space to create a whole new class that isn't encroaching on another class's space. And in fact, the folks at D&D even started making the Artificer as a wizard subclass, in fact. But they realized the depth that exists here and created a whole new awesome class for us to enjoy. And what really sets it apart from other classes is that the Artificer is centered on objects and invention. Eberron Rising from the Last War calls it arcane science. For comparison, thinking of spellcasters, the wizard is centered around their knowledge and their study. The sorcerer is centered around innate abilities that come from within and that the sorcerer utilizes. The cleric is centered around channeling divine energy to affect the world around them. But for the artificer... It's all about using invention and tinkering in order to put magic into effect. And it's about putting that magic into objects. It's creating magic through your tools as you work. And this restriction is actually built into the class too. 
where you have to actually have Tinkerer's Tools or some other artisan tool set in your hand in order for you to use most of your abilities. In fact, it essentially works as your spellcasting focus. And this is quite flavorful. I love this concept. I love this concept of you working through your tools with your tools being your spellcasting focus and, and always having that desire as an artificer for new innovation and invention. And this can be used in just about any setting too. Obviously, it has the widest application in Eberron for which it was originally created, but they also exist canonically in the other D&D worlds as well. There's actually a sidebar about that in page 54, which is where you can find the Artificer subclass in Eberron Rising from the Last War. And it lists several of the other places where you can find Artificers in official Dungeons and Dragons settings, but it can be utilized in even more campaign settings than that. It doesn't have to be something steampunky or any of those types of tropes. You just have to come up with a scenario where you have a magician who wields their power by working with their tools on an object. So let's just run through the Artificer and think about the ways that we can tell unique stories with this awesome class. We'll start, of course, as all classes start, with the hit points and proficiencies. Your hit dice are a d8 as a Artificer. You're proficient with light armor, medium armor, and shields, simple weapons. Your saving throws are constitution and intelligence, and you get to choose two from arcana, history, investigation, medicine, nature, perception, and sleight of hand for your proficient skills. But the most notable thing about your proficiencies is actually the thing which is my favorite about this entire class, and the thing which I think really sets this class apart, and that's the tool proficiencies. You start out just by being level one in the class, nothing to do with your background, nothing to do with anything else, you start out by being proficient with thieves' tools, tinkers' tools, and another type of artisan tools of your choice. And that is a lot of tool proficiencies. You're just proficient with those right off of the bat. And tools are so important for the artificer. Again, that's how you actually utilize your magic is through your tools as you're working on an object and there's so much customization here because there's a lot of different tool sets if you just do a search for all the artisan tool sets that you have there's alchemist supplies brewer supplies calligrapher supplies carpenter's tools cartographer's tools Cobbler's tools, cook's utensils, glass blower's tools, jeweler's tools, leather worker's tools, mason's tools, painter's supplies, potter's tools, smith's tools, weaver's tools, and woodcarver's tools. All of those options are artisan tools which you can use and you can choose as the tool which your particular artificer uses to bring about their magic in the world. And since your tools are where your magic is coming from, there's so many flavor options that you have. There's even a sidebar on page 56 in Eberron Rising from the Last War, which actually discusses this. It's called The Magic of Artifice. It says, as an artificer, you use tools when you cast your spells. When describing your spell casting, Think about how you're using a tool to perform the spell effect. If you cast Cure Wounds using alchemist supplies, you could be quickly producing a salve. If you cast it using Tinker's tools, you might have a miniature mechanical spider that binds up wounds. When you cast Poison Spray, you could fling foul chemicals or use a wand that spits venom. The effect of the spell is the same as for a spellcaster of any other class, but your method of spellcasting is special. The same principle applies when you prepare your spells. As an artificer, you don't study a spellbook or pray to prepare your spells. Instead, you work with your tools and create specialized items that you'll use to produce your effects. 
If you replace Cure Wounds with Heat Metal for your prepared spells, you might be altering the device you use to heal, perhaps modifying a tool so that it channels heat instead of healing energy. Such details don't limit you in any way, or provide you with any benefit beyond the spell's effects. You don't have to justify how you're using tools to cast a spell, but describing your spellcasting creatively is a fun way to distinguish yourself from other spellcasters. So if you're using your tools to work, we can think about how we're doing that. Again, this is my favorite part of of this entire class is this aspect. There's so many creative opportunities here. Are you an alchemist imbuing an object with a particular chemical? Are you a brewer crafting magical beers? Do you use calligraphy to make magical notes that take effect when read? Are you a cobbler and you have magical tap shoes and you tinker with different parts of the shoe with your tools so that you produce different effects? Do you use cook supplies to magically enhance a certain dish or, or pastry or something like that? Are you a glass blower and you're making certain glass shapes and glass runes or maybe even making shapes that you then shatter in order to produce the effects? There's so many different options that you can have and each one creates a whole unique feel for the character. And I love this. Thinking about this can really help play up our role playing and really help us tell really interesting stories with just how we're interacting with the world on a daily basis. Moving further along in the class now, we'll skip over the starting equipment and the optional firearm proficiency for now and move straight to the level 1 features that you get. The first one is called magical tinkering, and this essentially means that you can use your tools to grant a small, mundane, magical property to a random object. The object does have to be small, quite literally the tiny classification, but you can use your action to grant this otherwise non-magical object these magical effects. You can either have it produce light, or you can have it play a message whenever it's tapped by a creature, or you can have it continuously emit a sound or a odor, or you can have a visual effect on part of the object. And these effects that you choose last indefinitely. Until you actually touch it and choose to end it, you just have this cube with light that comes from it now. And you get to have a number of these objects active at one time that is equal to your intelligence modifier. And the only way they go away, unless you do dispel them yourself, is if you go above that limit. So say if your intelligence modifier is 3, and you have 3 of those items already, and you try to do a 4th, then the oldest effect that you had would then cease. But this is just so cool. You get to just use your tools to do sort of a mini temporary magical enchantment on a particular object. And again, depending on what tools you're using, that could look really different just depending on how you want to play this character. The second feature you get as soon as you choose level 1 in Artificer is your spellcasting abilities. And like we mentioned before, you need to have your tools to actually do this. You have to have a spellcasting focus, which is one of your tools, either these tools or some other kind of artisan's tools that you're proficient in, and use them as your focus. You are literally using your tools to produce these effects. Eberron, rising from the last war, describes it this way, saying, To observers, you don't appear to be casting spells in a conventional way. You look as if you're producing wonders using mundane items or outlandish inventions. And that's just so cool. That's just so flavorful that you're using tools and objects to produce magical effects. 
As far as the mechanics of your spells, your modifier is intelligence, and I do like that they chose this. I like that this was the first class that they actually brought out outside of the the traditional ones in the player's handbook, because it is nice to have another one other than just wizard that actually cares about your intelligence modifier. You do prepare your spells from the predetermined list of artificer spells known. You can ritual cast, but it's not like a wizard where you can ritual cast without a spell being prepared. You can just ritual cast and not use the spell slot if that spell is already prepared, making it like the druid ability rather than the wizard ability. You don't ever get incredibly high level spells. The highest you ever get, even at level 20, is level 5 spells, but... There are some really powerful and useful spells that you actually get access to from classic support spells like Cure Wounds, Lesser and Greater Restoration, Dispel Magic, Haste, Revivify, Fly, uh, those types of spells to fun and flavorful spells like Animate Objects. And again, think about how you're using your tools to produce these specific effects for instance, going back to the glass blowers tools scenario. Well, how do you use that to cast, say, the cantrip thunderclap? Well, maybe you craft and create a, a little Prince Rupert's drop and you know just how to imbue it with magical energy so that whenever it shatters instantly by cracking its tail and if you don't know what a prince rupert's drop is i highly suggest you look it up it's amazing it's a really cool feature of glass but whenever it shatters it you could just have it shoot out this booming thunderous wave that is heard from 100 feet away and causes thunder damage incredibly fun and flavorful at second level, you get a feature called Infuse Item. And if you're wondering why your spells only went up to level 5, well, this is a big part of why. Because you get the ability to, much more so than just with your minor magical tinkering ability, you get to actually imbue regular old items with certain properties. You start out by knowing four of these infusions from a list in the Artificer class here in Eberron Rising from the Last War. And you get to learn more and more as you keep going on. And each time you level, you can switch one in and out if you happen to not like one of the ones that you have. The way this works is that you can touch a non-magical object and turn it into a magical item with one of these certain effects. You have to be touching it, and each one of the items can only have one infusion at a time. And of course, as we mentioned, there is a limit to, depending on your level, how many items you can have imbued at a time. But this is just so powerful, being able to take certain items and just imbue it with magical energy, turning it into a magic item. A key thing about this process is that this happens when you finish a long rest. So this happens just like you prepare spells. And this is actually the case for several of the artificial abilities. Because again, flavor-wise, you're doing this with invention, with your tools. You're waking up in the morning and you're preparing what you have for the day. You are infusing magic into your stuff so that you can use it for the rest of the day's battles and for the rest of the day's journey. You can't do it just on a whim. It's something you do to prepare. And it does have to be a specific type of item. You can't just take a random, you know, purse and turn it into a magical sword. You know, you it has to be enhancing an item that actually would work as what you're turning it into. But you can do things like enhance a weapon where now all of a sudden it gets plus one to attack and damage and that increases to plus two when you hit 10th level same thing for touching a suit of armor or a shield and, and giving enhanced defense plus one to ac and then plus two at 10th level you could do things like create a homunculus servant which we'll discuss a little bit later in the wilds 
You can uh, take a simple or a martial weapon that has an ammunition property and give it a repeating shot ability so that it uh, reproduces its own ammunition whenever you make a ranged attack with it. And there's all sorts of replicate magic items too, where you can take a certain item and turn it into an actual magic item from the Dungeon Master's Guide. You could do things like touch a random jug and turn it into the classic alchemy jug. You can touch a bag and turn it into a bag of holding. You can touch a ring and turn it into a ring of water walking. You could touch a cloak and turn it into a cloak of the bat. You could do all sorts of these wonderful things and just create all these magic items it's just incredibly flavorful and interesting to just have your tools and and really think about how you're working with these different things to produce these different effects and you're just creating magic by inventing and tinkering and 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 innovation and it's just such a wonderfully flavorful and interesting feature At third level, you get your subclass called Artificer Specialist, and there's three of those, the Alchemist, the Artillerist, and the Battlesmith that are in Eberron Rising from the Last War. Again, we're going to cover that on a later episode. There's enough here to go over just with the basic class features. But you also, at third level, get the feature called Right Tool for the Job, which essentially, again, going back to tools, allows you to, with one hour of uninterrupted work, to create any set of artisan's tools that you need. Now, you can't just do this indefinitely, because you can only have one of these at a time. As soon as you try to produce another set, the first one fades but that's again just you're playing up this whole aspect of the tools and even more than that at sixth level you get tool expertise which means that your proficiency bonus is doubled when you're making any sort of ability check that is using a tool set that you're proficient in after that at seventh level you get your flash of genius feature And the flavor of this is that you're essentially just thinking really fast on the fly and coming up with solutions to whatever problems you're facing instantly and helping somebody out. So mechanically, whenever any creature or yourself within 30 feet of you makes an ability check or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to the roll. So if your intelligence modifier is plus three, they just get an instant plus three bonus to whatever check that they made. And you could use this feature a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier per long rest. And I like this feature too, because it plays up your intelligence. It plays up your quick thinking. It, it just really flavors you as this inventor that is just using their intellect and their tools to affect the world around them. And of course, with all the creation of magic items and all the things that you have to do with that, there are, of course, features related to magic items. There's three of them, in fact. Magic Item Adept at 10th level, Magic Item Savant at 14th, and Magic Item Master at 18th. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, if you're not aware, you can only be attuned to three magic items at any one time. Well, at 10th level, when you get Magic Item Adept, that changes. You get to attune to up to four. And you also get to craft magic items cheaper and faster. If you craft a magic item with a rarity of common or uncommon, it takes only a fourth of the time and it costs you half as much. At 14th level, it gets even better whenever your attunement limit goes up to five magic items. And you don't have to bother with any of the class or race or level requirements on attuning to a specific magic item. You know, some of the magic items that you see listed in the Dungeon Master's Guide or elsewhere are required to be attuned by, say, a paladin or something like that. There, there's certain requirements that only a certain type of entity can attune to and you ignore that as an artificer of 14th level you can just attune to whatever magic item you want and the final feature in this vein at 18th level lets you attune to up to six magic items at once and you'll make use of that too as you're just creating and infusing just mundane items in your possession with magic items and then if you say find something better well hey you can use something better 
But until that point, you're just thinking on the fly and just making all these unique magic items for you and your party mates to use. Going back to 11th level now, you have a feature called Spell Storing Item, and this is, just as it sounds, being able to store your spell in an item. It has to be a simple or a martial weapon, or an item that you can use as a spellcasting focus, which would be one of your tools, or you can also use one of your infused items as a spellcasting focus as well. But you can actually store a spell in that, a first or second level spell. And while holding that object, any creature, not just you, but any creature, can use an action to cast that spell, to produce that spell's effect, using your intelligence modifier, your spellcasting modifier, because you were the one who actually cast it. And it doesn't even go away right away. The spell stays in the object until it's been used a number of times equal to twice your intelligence modifier. So if your intelligence modifier is plus three, just to go back to that example, whoever has this particular item that you've imbued with the second level spell invisibility, so to speak, can cast invisibility six times before the effect goes away. Just think of how powerful that is just before your rogue goes off to actually infiltrate the particular facility and just he gets to just cast invisibility now even though he had no magical abilities before. Very powerful, very flavorful, and very cool. And the final feature that you get is Soul of Artifice at 20th level. And this allows you to get a plus one bonus to all saving throws per magic item that you have attuned. And as we mentioned, at 18th level, you got to move that number up to six. So why, as an artificer at 20th level, when you could create so many infusions, you do not have six equipped? I will never know. I assume you will just essentially be getting a constant plus six bonus to all of your saving throws at all times because of this feature. You also get the ability to, if you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can use your reaction to end one of the artificer infusions and you drop to one hit point instead of zero. And there's no limit on the amount of times you can do that. You just have to be able to have a reaction free to be able to do it. So until you run out of magically infused items, you can just keep dropping yourself to one hit point. I love the flavor of that too because you've been putting magic, you've been inventing into these certain items and then you use that particular magic to almost defend you in your time of need or send some of your essence, perhaps you flavor it, back from that object to heal you just slightly to keep you from being on the brink of death. There's just fascinating flavor here in this class. So if you haven't played one of these, I encourage you to do it. Come up with some really unique combination of tool sets and abilities and think of how your character is just going around using their alchemist supplies or their woodworker's tools to actually affect the world around them by their own arcane science. It really is a brilliant class. But I think that's about all the time we have for the prime material today. Why don't we head over to the wilds and look at the homunculus? here in the wilderness. Today we're going to talk about the homunculus. And the homunculus has a classic stat block, which you find in the Monster Manual page 132, but it's also one of the things that you can create as an artificer. It's one of your infusions, is to actually create what's called a homunculus servant. And the stat blocks do have some differences. 
As far as the regular homunculus is concerned, I'm pretty sure this is the first time we've had a challenge rating zero here on the podcast, because this thing is incredibly weak. It has five hit points and a 13 armor class for a tiny, squirrel-sized companion. But really what makes it interesting is the fact that it has an implicit connection with its maker. The homunculus and whatever made it have this mystical bond where no matter where they're at, as long as they're on the same plane of existence, they could communicate telepathically. The homunculus also knows everything that its creator knows, even all the languages that its creators can, can read or speak, although the homunculus cannot speak on its own. And despite being so weak, the homunculus is a really interesting thing to throw in. He could be a minion of the big bad evil guy. He could also be just a random thing that the party is interacting with in the town. And they just keep seeing this entity go in and out of a shop. And maybe that homunculus is just going there to shop for something. Maybe that's where the actual person who's bonded with the homunculus, who created the homunculus, is. Or maybe the party is interacting with an NPC that is reclusive. And the party doesn't even know where he is. The only way they've ever interacted with it is with this particular homunculus there's so many different little hooks that you can use for a tiny little companion creature like this to work it into a narrative and provide a little bit of intrigue or just a little bit of levity to a situation great comic relief character just to have a goofy little tiny homunculus wandering around a workshop One word of warning on that front, of course, is that the fact that the homunculus and its master are implicitly connected, if the master dies, if the creator dies, so will the homunculus. So if your party you think is going to get incredibly attached to a very cute homunculus you've made, perhaps setting that in a situation where you know they're going to go after the person who made the homunculus maybe would be a recipe for some feel bad so we have to be wary of that but they are flexible in how they actually look there is a specific look that the homunculus in the monster manual has but i would argue that the creator could create this little tiny entity looking however he wanted And that is actually explicitly stated, transitioning now to the homunculus servant as one of the things the artificer can do. It's actually stated that they can actually determine the homunculus's appearance. Now, for the one you can make for the class, there is no real implicit telepathic connection. It's friendly to you and it obeys your commands, but it doesn't actually do anything but serve you. There's no complete and total connection as there is with the homunculus and the monster manual. At the same time, though, it is slightly more powerful. It's still got a 13 AC, but its hit points are a lot bigger. Its hit points are equal to its constitution modifier, which is plus one, plus your intelligence modifier, and your level in the artificer class. It's got the evasion feature, just like a rogue, so if it has to make a dex save and it fails, it takes half damage, and if it succeeds, it takes no damage. It also has a feature called Might of the Master, which allows it to increase its particular abilities as your proficiency bonus goes up. Every time your proficiency bonus goes up by one, its skill bonuses, its saving throw bonuses, and the bonuses to hit and damage of its attack all go up by one as well. Its attack is also more powerful as well. The homunculus in the monster manual just has a chance to do one piercing damage and then make you make a DC 10 con save. And if you fail, you're poisoned for a minute. And if you fail by more than five, you're poisoned for 1d10 minutes and unconscious while you're poisoned but there's no actual risk of life loss there it's just giving you the poison condition or at worst you go unconscious for a few minutes unless you're in a much larger fight where the homunculus is active there's not much chance of that actually doing anything 
But while it's still weak, the homunculus servant in Eberron Rising from the Last War is much stronger. It has an attack with a range of 30 feet that can do 1d4 plus 2 force damage. Not much by any stretch of the imagination, but it can actually do some damage. Now, in order to do that, you have to command it to do that. In combat, the homunculus only takes the dodge action on its turn unless you take a bonus action to command it to do something specific on your turn. It can either attack or take the dash, disengage, help, hide, or search action. Quite possibly the most interesting, unique ability about the homunculus servant is its channel magic reaction that it actually has, where it can actually deliver a spell that you cast that has a range of touch. So, for instance, if you want to cast Cure Wounds on a particular creature, but you're a long way away, well, the homunculus, as long as it's within 120 feet of you, can go up to that creature, touch him, and you can cast the spell and actually channel your magic through that homunculus and cast the spell without actually touching that entity yourself. A very flavorful and cool feature. Personally, I see nothing wrong with combining the best of both worlds for these monsters and giving it to an NPC for use in one of the things that we already described. It could be a really interesting hook into an NPC that you want the party to find or just really interesting flavor once they actually find it. You should definitely try to work one into a game if you haven't already. But I think we've been out here in the wilds long enough. Let's head over to the tavern and get some refreshment. All right, we're out here in the tavern. Today's plot hook. What would you do if something went wrong at a performance? Now, as I feel like I've said a few times now here in the tavern section, this is not something we can do a lot because we want our players to have moments where their guard isn't fully up. We want our players to be able to relax. We want our players to be able to go to the carnival, to be able to have sessions where they just play carnival games and it's nice and and there's levity and it's just a really nice, calm, enjoyable session. But a performance, a public setting like an opera or a play or something like that can be a fascinating place to actually set an encounter. And there's lots of different things that could go wrong. You could have something wrong with the show itself, where something happens to one of the performers on stage. You could have something happening behind the scenes at the show, where maybe nothing goes wrong on stage, but maybe something is happening behind the stage and there's a commotion and maybe upon investigation you discover that this traveling carnival or what have you has been a smuggling ring of sorts and there was a kerfuffle a disagreement behind the scenes so you could have something actually go wrong with the performance itself you could also have something go wrong within the audience Maybe there's a fight in the audience. Maybe all of a sudden a big explosion or something happens in the audience. Or maybe someone in the audience attacks someone on stage. And in any of those scenarios where all of a sudden there's a big unexpected commotion or, or something as drastic as an explosion, there's going to be panic. There's going to be pandemonium. That whole crowd is going to be rushing, trying to get out of there. And your party is suddenly in a situation where they have to make split-second decisions right on the fly. And I think this is a great opportunity to use timed turns in an encounter. This is something I would not do much, and I would not do it unless you're confident in your player's skill level, ability, and familiarity with their current characters. Because while you want there to be a sense of urgency, you want to get across that they're making these decisions so fast in the moment, in the middle of such complete pandemonium as everyone's running screaming, you don't want them to be paralyzed with all the different decisions that they have at their disposal because they're not used to the particular decision trees that they might have. 
But if you think your party is ready for it, that would be a great opportunity to just break out a 30 second timer where you have to say what you're going to do within 30 seconds and, and complete your turn really fast as everything is just moving so fast around you because of the pandemonium that's happened. You could also have something go wrong at the show by just something happening really subtly. Think James Bond Quantum of Solace, where that meeting is happening at the opera, where these nefarious individuals are all seated throughout the complex with earpieces talking to one another here just at this opera. Well, that could happen pretty easily in Dungeons & Dragons with telepathy. What happens if one of your party members who can communicate with telepathy all of a sudden starts picking some of this up? Or maybe there's something that starts coming in accidentally to one of these players where someone maybe started communicating with the wrong person. And now all of a sudden this moment of light and levity as the party is here trying to enjoy the show is broken up with just this complete mystery and intrigue and and leads into a whole arc about uncovering what exactly is going on. But there's lots of different ways that you can use this type of encounter. And players, I'm sure next time a carnival rolls into the town, just I'm sure it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I think that's about all the time that we have for this week's episode of Plot Hooks. Thanks very much for listening from all of us here at Plot Hooks. Thanks again, Kevin, for joining the Patreon. Thanks again to all those who've said kind things about the Ichmaset race. Be sure to check out the artist, Devin Simmons, on Twitter and Instagram. You can find him at Dev Makes Things. And we look forward to continuing to release more stuff for everyone up there on our Patreon. Thanks again for listening. I'm Samuel. Thanks from Matt, Mike, Steve, Dave, Zach, Becca, and podcast Pupper Ellie. We'll see you all again next week for another episode of Plot Hooks.